it to the cloud. Okay, everybody, we have started the meeting. Uh, welcome to City Island Rising and to our July 16th meeting of 2020. My name's John Doyle, for all of you who don't know me, and I wanna thank you for coming and attending these meetings and uh, particularly for bearing with us as we learn all this new and exciting technology. Um, we have an agenda. If you haven't seen it, that's fine. It's, uh, it's in the chat function. So go to the chat function. You can also submit your questions and answers. Um, if we don't get to them in time, we will work diligently to get them to you afterwards, which is very important. Um, I know over 30 people did RSVP to the meeting, and I know that we are competing against, um, we are competing against, uh, uh, you know, a very important meeting with the Department of Education, which is on a similar medium. So I'm sure people are going to file in as they file in. If anyone needs anything, just message me and I promise I will get to you. But we're going to kick it off. And we're going to start right now. And our first matter is very important to us maintaining our 501c3 status and continuing to do good work. And that's uh, Beverly Jones, who is our secretary, is going to lead us on a discussion of internal governance. And for those of you who don't know, Beverly is always working very hard behind the scenes to make sure we don't get ourselves into trouble. Thank you. So, John, so long as we, uh, you know, left the first five minutes of this meeting without the Zoom going down, we'll be more successful than the DOE meeting because uh, it was a bit of a nightmare. Uh, <laughs> And I think they lost a lot of people. Um, thank you, John. I appreciate that introduction. Um, and so I wanted to just share um, with the group, in, in large part to the COVID-19 crisis, we missed some governance steps this spring. Um, you know, the last few months, uh, we uh, on the City Island Rising Board, along with everybody else, have been really focused, um, you know, both, both individually and as a group, figuring out how to respond to the health, economic, and social challenges we've all been facing between um, COVID and uh, exceptionally high rates of unemployment um, and Black Lives Matter. Um, and these um, all for incredibly good have taken precedence um, uh, over some uh, more housekeeping type issues. Um, but this has really taken us away from focusing on internal governance practices. Um, and we, we are very serious about upholding those practices um, because as John mentioned, they're very important um, to maintaining our, our status uh, legally and, and whatnot. And as you know, we're also very committed to transparency and to following best practices. Um, we want to bring some of the governance practices we developed when we formed the organization about a year ago back to the forefront now, and this means that the first thing I need to do is flag for you um, that the organization has not had um, its annual member meeting, um, which our bylaws require us to hold in April of each year. Um, at that meeting, um, uh, we are directed to elect or reelect officers and half of our directors. We have staggered terms so that every year we um, uh, uh, elect or reelect half. And we established this um, to show, even in the in our founding documents, that we're committed to bringing in and creating regular on ramps to members of our, of our community who wish to be doing who wish to be part of doing the work of running City Island Rising. Um, you know, this is um, this is not this is not um, a, a, a small and insular group um, uh, that that hoards power um, or or. You know, as any belief that our voices are any more valuable than any any other member of our community. Um, it's just people who want to do the work um, this group together and carrying on the, the business of the organization. Um, because we're still in the middle of the pandemic, um, and, um, you know, I think Fauci said that we're still very much in phase one um, and very far from getting back to normal. Um, if it's all right with everybody here, what we'd like to do um, is to extend the current officer's terms through to the next annual meeting, which will be held next April. Um, the current officers are, are uh, John as president, Kim Woodruff as treasurer, and myself as secretary. So let me um, pause for a moment. I think folks can um, uh, put in the chat if, if anybody has a, a, an objection or, or, a, or a challenge with that, um, we would want to hear we would want to hear um, from you.
I just have a tangential uh, but related question. Yes, Steve. Um, so is there, like, what are the parameters for membership? Because up until this point, like as far as I, I'm not a member, I've never paid dues or anything like that. Like what does it take to become a member? So, so there's three types of um, folk who are included in the bylaws, right? Um, there are no um, like dues paying members. The reason why we didn't want that is because we don't want there to be any barriers of entry to people feeling like they belong in this group. You're a member if you say you're a member. Um, it's, a, it's a little M member. It doesn't have a governance uh, component to it. But, um, you know, any, anybody who, who comes to a meeting and, and wants to say that they're affiliated with City Island Rising is, is, a, is a little M member of, of the group. Um, you know, and, and, and not having barriers to entry was really important to us. Um, then there is a, a, well, I guess there's four groups. Then there's a steering committee, which are the folks who have sort of raised their hands and said, I want to be a little bit more involved. I want to help craft the agendas. I want to, um, uh, be part of the conversations about what, what we talk about from week to week. Um, from that steering committee, um, we, uh, have elected uh, directors and there's usually around 10. These are separated into the two classes that I mentioned before. Um, the directors get elected at each, uh, sorry, like I said, the half of the directors get elected at each annual meeting um, and anybody who wants to be a director can raise their hand and identify themselves to any of the current directors and say, I want to be a director or I want to be on the steering committee. Um, uh, you know, we, there is, there is plenty of work to go around, um, and, um, we want anybody who wants to help, um, to pitch in and, and, and be part of, part of that process. Um, and then of the directors each year, we, um, name, we name between three and five officers. And right now we have three, we have a president, secretary, and a treasurer, which are required, um, under New York state law, um, to, to have those, those three. And, and the, each of each of we three has some specific duties that are assigned in the bylaws. Does that is that responsive to your question, Steve? Absolutely. Thank you. That was actually very thorough. Uh, thank you so much. No problem. Um, okay. So I I um. So Roy asked a question. Where can I get a copy of the governance documents? There, I think that we have um. And, and now we're getting into technology, so my my fellow uh, board members are going to have to help. I think we have a Google Docs area where you yes. can. Yes. So we're going to make a pledge, and this is a good thing about having these things on video is that it keeps us accountable too. Uh, we're going to make a pledge that all of our internal governance documents, agendas of both our board meetings and our um, and our regular meetings, as well as our minutes from our board meetings are all going to be put onto a Google Drive doc for now. And that way everyone can access them. It's, they're totally transparent. Uh, and then what we are working on, uh, Louisa, myself, uh, Kim Woodruff and a few others is we're gonna do as, there you go. Uh, we're gonna do um, a website that will be coming online soon. And we actually have somebody who's volunteering their time to help put that together and make that really nice. It's been a little on the back burner with everything going on but the goal is to have at least the Google Drive up to be fully transparent, which has always been our goal. And then after that, we'll have the, the website up once we start taking pictures and getting our bios together and, and getting the content that could be very helpful. Yeah, cool. So it, it sounds like folks are okay with our extending the current officer's terms um, to next April. We also plan to look at potentially adding new officers at that time. So stay tuned, we'll, we'll have more information on that in early 2021. Um, but we, we do also want to add new directors um, to the board um, at all of our annual meetings. So if you're interested in serving on the board, um, or, or you, you're not quite sure if you want, you know, a, a formal board role, but want to serve on the steering committee, please let any of us know and, and, and we'll, uh, you know, talk with you and, 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 um, figure out the right, the right route based on what, um, it is that you want to, that you want to do and how, how much you want to be involved. Um, so you can, um, private message me, um, or John, um, or any, any other, uh, member of the, member of the board. 
Um, are there any additional questions? Great, hearing none, I really appreciate your um, bearing with us. Uh, it's been an interesting spring um, and um, we, we, uh, we, we are committed to taking this stuff um, seriously. Um, and John, thanks for the time uh, up front on the agenda uh, to, to get, get through the uh, housekeeping matters. Absolutely. And, you know, this is very important to maintaining our structure and being open and transparent. So no one could have predicted the pandemic, but next, uh, next April, things are going to be really, uh, you know, changing. And again, there are term limits for all of our officers, for all of our board members, for my position. So in a few years, you know, this will be a group that will always reflect the community because there'll always be change and change is the fact of life. Okay, um, with that in mind, we're gonna move, and thank you, Beverly. With that in mind, we're gonna move on to our guest speaker, which was someone who we arranged, uh, you know, a very topical and uh, very important everything that's going on on City Island right now. And that's um, Abby Rosenwake, who's with the City Island Anti-Racist Organizing Group, and they've been doing a lot of great work. So Abby, I'm gonna unmute you. And uh, whatever, you know, if you can just bring us up to speed as to what's going on. We did get a few questions uh, when we, what we're trying to do now is when we send out our email, we ask for people to send us the action items they want to talk about or they want considered. And there were quite a few which were related to Black Lives Matter, the protest right. that was organized, and where we go from here. So, but fill us in, please. Sure, sure. Um, and I recognize a lot of the names, but not everyone. And you probably don't necessarily recognize my name because it's been, last time I was at a rising meeting, I was very pregnant and I have a nine month old now. So i <laughs> um, glad to be back. So, so yeah, as many of you, um, probably all of you know, we had a, a, a really powerful protest um, early June. And a group after that, a group of us got together and just started talking about what else can we do here on the island to make it a safer space for, for everyone and to make the island more welcoming for, for everyone of, of every race um, and especially, especially um, trying to make it um, safe and more comfortable for um, black folks on the island, people of color, um, because as we've seen from the Facebook groups and all sorts of um, things just from having ears and looking around, it's, it's not always the most welcoming. And uh, obviously there's a lot going on in our country right now. And um, we just wanna you know, be part of making change. And so we are um, still sort of figuring out like exactly what our mission is. Um, we're in the in midst of crafting that um, mission, vision, sort of like what are our, um, goals as, as an organization and how are, are we going to operate as a group. Um, it is obviously messy work to talk about race uh, and racism and, and how to be anti-racist. And so that's work we're just kind of grappling with and, and diving into. Um, so we're meeting um, because this work is so personal and because it is so hard, uh, we have found that it is better. We've tried Zoom too. But we found it's better to meet uh, in person. Um, building trust and relationships is a huge part of this work, of course, too. Uh, so we are meeting in like large backyards, um, six feet apart with masks. We're taking, we're being very cautious. Um, and, um, but yeah, so right now we're meeting about one to two times a week, still trying to figure out the frequency um, and, you know, try to make it so that as many people can come. Um, so thinking about timing of meetings. Um, but yeah, I mean, our work really is to um, work for racial equity and, you know, challenging racist ideology and rhetoric in our community and, um, and yeah, and also just supporting like black owned businesses. I know there's a couple black owned businesses on the island um, and then thinking about future events, whether it's more rallies, um, other community building um, equity focus events that we can um, create too. So that's what we're working on right now. Um, but yeah, if you would like to join um, if you are troubled by what's going on in our country um, that's been going on for the past 400 years, but certainly bubbling to the surface right now in this challenging time. Um, 
you know, reach out to the email, um, City Island Rising, and you can pass it along to, to our group, and we would love to, to have you. Thank you, Abby, so much for laying that out. Does anyone, if anyone has any questions for Abby, because um, her time is valuable and I know she's running between a few things, if people can either raise their hands or type something in the chat, you know, we'll of course recognize you and, you know, you can ask your question because, you know, this is about the free exchange of information and we have someone already. Okay, uh, Rose, uh, Rose just asked, which businesses are black owned? Oh, good question. Um, so I know that the City Island Juice Bar is, and I, the Sea Breeze next door is either black owned or a person of color owns it. I'm still unclear, um, but yeah, those are the two. And then I think um, Augie's is owned um, by a person of color. Um, if I, sh I could be missing some, so. Also the Midford Arena is minority owned. Okay. Also um, Oh, and the architect next to the school is a person of color as well. Mm -hmm. Right after the schoolyard. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Mr. King. Yes. Seabreeze. Seabreeze is a Latino family, I believe. Uh, I think they're, I think they're uh, Mexican. They're very nice. And just to, just to chime in, so if anybody wants to join us, I don't my camera's not working, but not a big deal. If anyone wants to join us, um, we generally meet, just to add on to what Abby said, um, we generally meet um, Tuesdays and or Sundays, and it's pretty loose and casual, but we welcome more people who are um, interested in the conversation. And we just want to be clear that if you're new to this, it's totally acceptable. Because at yeah. some point we were all new to this, uh, myself included, and... Um, we want to sort of continue to make City Island more welcoming for people who potentially historically didn't feel welcome. Um, and if anyone wants, um, we have some signage and stuff. If anyone wants anything for their windows, um, you can either email Rising or um, uh, you can stop by my shop, 239 City Island Avenue. We generally have things to give out if anyone wants them, or we more encourage you to make them yourselves. Um, because again, it's more about, um, making people feel included and figuring out how to make everybody feel safe in our neighborhood. Um, so we just wanted to reach out and say anyone on Rising who hasn't been talking to us directly, um, please do because it's been sort of incredibly enlightening and um, we all have a lot to learn. So just to chime in. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Oh, and um, we have, and then the last thing on that is um, message us because we have, we have something in the works for August 1st. We don't know exact details, but um, we want to get together in some faction on that day in public stuff. Um, so reach out to us um, and we will um, include you as to what's going on. Um, we're only, uh, in theory, we'd like to meet you first in person just so we make sure everybody's safe and secure in, in what's going on. Um, so but reach out um, because we would like to make this more diverse and more inclusive than we already are. So thanks. Mm -hmm. Abby, um, as you guys get organized, if you are thinking about what's the next step in terms of potentially becoming more formal as an organization or just want to kind of know what the options are, um, let me know because I'm happy to come and, and provide um, uh, some legal information um, uh, that, that, you know, to, to help guide your decision making um, as, as you guys are sort of uh, formalizing and, and you know, becoming an, an ongoing um, effort. Um, there's there's a bunch of different options um, to help, you know, keep the organization safe and legal um, in terms of fundraising and that kind of thing. Um, so I'm happy to help. Thank, thank, thank you, you Beverly. Beverly. Yeah, that would be helpful, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I see there's in the comments, there's a few more Black-owned business. Thank you. Thank you for adding those. So check out the comments, um, everyone, for that. Um, and just to add on what, to what Dan shared, um, it does may seem minor or maybe like doesn't make a difference, but even something as simple as if you're just like wondering where to start, something as simple as hanging those Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter signs in your window, make, you know, it, it does, it speaks volumes. I know from my, my five-year-old, she sees one down the street, she like freaks out, she gets so excited and she says like, oh, I matter, I matter. Like, it's like, I mean, how powerful is that? So certainly um, encourage that. Um, and sort of, uh, sorry, one last thing to add, um, seems really simple, but um, 
obviously nonviolent, non disruptive. That's not on anyone's agenda. Um, we want to, or the opposite of that, we just want everybody to feel included. So, um, in case there's any preconceived notions of any of that stuff, um, or we'd happily talk to you about it if, if you want to discuss any of actions or how, how to process things. Because again, we're all kind of learning about this together. Did we lose John? That looks like he's connecting. Looks like he's reconnecting. I don't think we have word uh, on. Sorry IC. about that. I'm um, here. Sorry. Um, thank you all for that. And um, uh, you know, just on a personal note, it is nice to see. I know we have a long way to go, but it is nice to see so many of the Black Lives Matter signs uh, on the side streets, on the main streets. People you you know don't normally see getting involved in kind of the political uh, back and forth on the island. It's just, it's, it's very heartwarming to see that we're all elevating voices that, you know, unfortunately have has been historically marginalized and deserve every, you know, a blessing right that we all enjoy. So thank you. Um, so then after that, and thank you, Abby, you were great. Um, let's, I guess, Kim, I see Kim is on the the line. Kim, would you prefer to go now? Because I know you want to speak about something related, or would you prefer to go later in the meeting? I'll just go ahead because I don't know what else um, is planned. And sure. I actually have been. Uh, I'm going to pile on a lot because I probably should have said something since the last meeting. And um, so uh, I'll just start with, my name is Kim and I've lived on City Island for 15 years and I have uh, two daughters, both who um, you know, attended PS 175 and, and my husband is, uh, lives here as well. So, uh, and back to last month again, we all experienced kind of a collective trauma with that, with that Zoom bombing that happened, which is a, another reason why I, I didn't speak up um, at the last meeting, but um, something happened just yesterday that I just could not ignore. And it's something that I think the community should know about because it just felt like if it hadn't happened to me and my daughter, that it would have been you know hard to believe that this even happened in the community. Because as I said, I've lived here for so many years and haven't really experienced anything, um, you know, of that sort in, in that amount of time. So um, my daughter was out skateboarding yesterday near the foot of the bridge and she saw an older um, white man, probably in his 50s, um, bringing a large wooden plaque to hang at the foot of the bridge that said, all lives matter. And she uh, approached him cordially from what she, um, how she tells the story. Audio cut out. Kim, we lost, Kim. Your, lost your audio. Oh. Uh, Kim, yeah. Are you there? Kim? I am. Okay, I am. sorry about that. We promoted you to a panelist so people could see you, and for some reason it muted you. You're back. Okay, so what should I do? Just, Just talk. You're right good. where you left off. Right where you left off. Sorry about that. Okay, could you remind me what I was saying? You were talking about your daughter skateboarding and what happened. Yeah, she saw a man walking toward the bridge with a large wooden plaque that said, all lives matter. And the way that she tells it, she cordially asked him not to um, post it and explain that it offended her. And he was dismissive. And um, she said that he cursed, but he, you know, then denied it and just said, you know, get away, basically, you know, you don't matter. So she came home and, and told me and grabbed some flyers that she had already prepared because we have gone to an anti-police um, brutality rally in the past and intended to go and hang her flyers as well. And um, my maternal instincts didn't kick in. I'm kind of beating myself up about that. Um, even still today that I allowed her to go because I trusted that she could handle herself 
Um, I didn't mention maybe I had that she's 14 years old and um, very vocal and can stand her ground in situations. But I, I do have a view of the bridge from my living room and I saw that it was becoming confrontational. So I, I ran out and there had already been a couple of people who came to her defense and um, you know, was telling, was telling the, the, the man why it was that she would be offended by having that um, posted and, and more people started to congregate. People of color were in defense as well as one other um, white man. I don't know whether or not he lives here on the island, but um, someone pulled out a blade in order with the intention to cut down the sign. Um, and so the blade itself was never exposed. It was, it was covered, but the fact that an instrument was, um, you know, taken out of someone's pocket and that there was a tussle was of course scary and just the obvious um, clue that this could have escalated and ended much, much worse. So um, I, I just, you know, it's still like a new experience and I'm processing it, but even from the last meeting, I wanted to mention that I'm a person of multi-ethnic, multicultural background and have been bullied for, you know, that reason, the 40 plus years of my life. And, um, you know, I dealt with it, but the hurt just takes a whole nother level when 30 years later, your child is experiencing and being sub, you know, subjugated to similar behavior. And it's like, you know, even worse. And, and this is supposed to be our home, you know, this, that, that is the main point. We, we live here too. And here in City Island, it's not just a matter of uh, black versus white. There's this other culture of, you know, the clam diggers versus the others. And it's, it's multi, multifaceted. And I, I just want people to realize that you don't have to have language or behavior that's intentionally racist in order to make people feel unwelcome. Um, you know, there's body language such as, um, you know, inadvertently turning away or avoiding eye contact, which is devalidating. And uh, people of color feel unseen and unheard in their daily life. So, you know, just say hi and smile. And, and that says to someone, you matter. Um, but if we don't tell you these things, like you, you wouldn't know, right? Because it's not your, your lived reality. And um, as I said, I've lived here for 15 years and I still get happy when I see another brown body, you know, walking in the streets because we're still the exception. And, um, you know, I have to say as a fairer skinned person of color that I also am afforded some privilege uh, in that I don't experience the microaggressions or the aggressions as much as someone with a darker skin tone would. But, you know, that's a matter of introspection on my part and, and building the empathy and, and you know, everyone just has to, has to do the work. Because as I said, we, we live in the community together and that's what we should be doing is building community. I mean, I've been here in the island for so long, but didn't know about City Island Rising until most recently Kim Woodruff um, invited me to the Clippers. I think that might have been back in November or so. And I've, I'm glad to hear and I've had, you know, great communication with you, John, and, and I appreciate, you know, all of the movements that are happening, but especially um, the fact that, that I, I met you at the rally that Steve and I think Abby um, organized. So thank you for creating these spaces and, and trying to make everyone feel as safe as possible. Uh, Kim, thank you for that. And thank you for sharing your experience. And, you know, this is what it's about, right? Like learning from the, the first person experience you had and, and, and trying to put you know, yourself in those shoes and trying to, to learn from that. And you, know, you raised some very good points in what you said. And you know, there are many great things about living here, but no, nothing in life is perfect. And you know, there are things we need to do to make sure that everyone knows that we need everybody at the table and you know that that black voices not not only are matter but are necessary to the discussion about how to move this community forward so i want you to know that you know absolutely we want everybody coming back and we want to create 
a space here where all different viewpoints are reflected because that's going to build the best public outcome in terms of public process, right? When, all, when, when your voice is heard and when you're treated with respect and when other people are treated with respect and we can all learn from your, you know, we'll never have the exact same experience, but I appreciate what you said and, you know, you've taught me something. So I want to thank you. And I know that I'm, that's not just me saying that that's everyone. So thank you for sharing what you did. And, um, and you know, you, you did take some video and we'll, we'll talk about the best way to move forward with that. Absolutely. Thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you so much, absolutely. Kim, can we reach out to you? Would you mind? Oh, sure, um, um, John has my email. And, and, sure. and I'm sorry that that happened to you on City Island and may you never feel by yourself ever again. Cause I'm sorry, I don't know who's speaking right now. Oh, I'd it's... like to see or hear or know the name of the person. Oh, that... my name is Dan Triber. My camera's not working, I'm sorry. Um, okay, may, thank may you. you never, may you never feel alone ever again, because um, it's not okay at all. Um, so we will we will reach out to you because um, I would love to hear what you have to say. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Tim, this is okay. Beverly. I'm one of the other officers of City Island Rising, and I just want to echo John's gratitude to you for share being brave to share this story today. And um, I think you are an excellent mom. Um, and uh, I look forward to meeting you face-to-face uh, -face, uh, on, on the island one of these days very soon. Um, and um, I really appreciate your um, uh, sh sharing that with us. Um, you know, I think that I speak um, uh, for the board when I say that we are committed to, to not just principles of non-discrimination, but to being an anti-racist organization. Um, and so many have already said we, we, are, we are learning and, and working on growing um, ourselves and, um, and, and you've helped us to do that today. Thank you so much. I appreciate the feedback, I'm glad. Uh, Steve had his hand up, so I just unmuted Steve so he could say something, I assume. Thanks, John. Hi, Kim, this is Steve Suzuki. Um, Hi. This is actually for everyone um, that's gathered here. Uh, something that kind of occurred to me as Kim was telling her story is I heard about this when the day that it happened, but not until after it had happened. And so one thing that kind of occurred to me, and this doesn't require any, uh, like, this isn't for like a, a decision now, just something I kind of want to put in people's minds. Um, you know, I, Abby before spoke about the anti-racist uh, group, which I'm a part of, and how we're trying to deepen, you know, trust and like build connections and stuff like that. Um, and so obviously I think that that's very important. Once we're at a level where we feel comfortable supporting each other, how would people here feel about some type of like rapid response team that if something like that happens, we're not finding out about it five, six hours after the fact. Like I was on City Islands when that happened. And if I knew that there was a 14 year old girl of color who was basically getting accosted by some, some old white guy who wants to put up an all lives matter uh, sign, that's something where I would have been at the bridge in five minutes, you know? Because I do think that there's something to be said for, you know, solidarity, standing in solidarity with each other. And also in my experience, you know, as an activist and as a protester and an organizer, there really is strength in numbers. People who would be adversarial and confrontational tend to back down when they see that, like I have no doubt in my mind that this guy, you know, had no problem confronting a 14 year old girl. Cause you know, that's probably, that, that says a lot about him. But if there were other people there, people, uh, you know, that are old, you know, adults. And also frankly, for the white people on the call, this is like when we talk about white privilege, this is a good way we can use our white privilege constructively to create space for a, a, you know, a, a teenage, you know, black or, or, you know, black girl, person of color to, you know, be able to say like, no, this isn't okay. You shouldn't be doing that. So again, not something I'm, I'm asking for like a vote on or anything, but just something I kind of want to throw out there as a possibility of like some type of like, you know, group email or group text or something where we could be on hand, you know, to support each other when necessary. And Kim, thank you again for, you know, sharing your story. And I just want to echo what everyone said that we're 100% with you. Thank you. There were multiple people who did stop. Um, they, the majority of them were not from City Island because I did ask. Um, but the person who hung the plaque also mentioned that he was actually frustrated that this is the second time that he's hanging the plaque and that it was torn down um, and that he did intend to, to hang it again. And I totally, you know, told him that he had 
a right to express his, you know, First Amendment freedom of speech, but that just out of consideration when you uh, see that you're getting a negative reaction and if a child is telling you that you're hurt, that they're hurt by it, that on some level I was hoping to appeal to his sensibility and what other empathy he may have to just take that into consideration. But the fact that, you know, he was so defensive and talking about how his family came here, you know, from Ireland because of the potato famine and, you know, reverse discrimination because he didn't get a job in, uh, in California. It was just, he was making it, he was just asserting his white- None of which, dominance. none of which is invalidated by saying Black Lives Matter. I mean, and, I, and, I don't know. It's and let's be honest, let's be honest. There's been seven Black Lives Matter flags taken down from the bridge. Not a single American flag has been touched. Not a single support the first responders has been touched. So for anyone to say that this isn't an intentional thing is not paying attention. So no, he totally point. admitted that. And the thing about it was that he was so smug and he wasn't angry. He wasn't ag angry. He was anything they said to him. He just said, well, that's your opinion. But everything that he said was supposed to be taken like as fact. And he specifically said that I hung this up. I was like, yes, I agree that all lives matter. Nobody's debating you on that. But he admitted that the reason why he hung that was in response to there being a Black Lives logo on, you know, the banner with the rainbow that, on the, is, that is inclusive. Yeah. So the, basically, he, I, this, he just felt threatened by the fact that that ethnicity was yeah. mentioned, but then <laughs> doesn't see that he's not creating, he doesn't understand or he didn't want to hear that, yes, we know all lives matter, but Black and brown lives are the ones that are being brutalized and oppressed and marginalized. Like he just mm -hmm. didn't get that. He's like, yeah, but my family, some were, you know, killed in the Holocaust too, kind of attitude. Well, I mean, that's not appropriate. And I'm again sorry that happened to to you. And you know, just just for everyone's uh, kind of knowledge base here, we are trying, you know, to improve the community and change the culture. That's why we started the welcoming committee because we want to send people a wealth, you know, we want to treat people, you, you touched on a good point here, that, you know, we have this like weird caste system that we don't need. Everyone when they come here should immediately be valued. They should immediately be welcomed. Everybody has something they can contribute on this island. There's not a person <laughs> who lives on this island who cannot teach someone else on this island something different or someone who's just visiting. It's the same thing. And we've all got to be, you know, open to new people open to new cultures, you know, the island is diversifying and, you know, that's a good thing, in my opinion. It's a very good thing and it has been, you know, ra more rapid from when I was growing up as well. So, you know, thank you for sharing that. And towards that end, uh, Lauren Nye, who is one of our directors, she couldn't be here tonight, but our board put together a collection of resources that we found online with respect to Black Lives Matter. It's in the link in the Google Doc. It's a, like a PowerPoint, and I don't think it, unfortunately, I was trying early, I don't think it will let me share it, but the link is there. So I, again, encourage everybody to go into the chat, to please look at the agenda, and look at what Lauren put together, uh, you know, in collaboration with all of us, Louisa, Beverly, Teresa, David Diaz, myself, and everyone else, because we, we do want to share resources, you know, so that everybody can gain a new understanding of these issues because we you know people like me need to listen a little bit more so i want to thank you for for what you said there can um, i just add something to that this is abby rosen absolutely again. yeah absolutely. um i just i i want i want to challenge all of us and i'm by no means an expert in, in um anti-racist work i'm still pretty new to it myself um but I, this goes beyond inclusiveness and mm -hmm. making people feel welcome and you know everyone should feel you know safe You're right. here on the community and i do think that um i mean my heart is racing because like the like inclusiveness to me is is just it's just not giving what what's going on justice and no this does not feel like a safe place for my family. Um, my kids are biracial. My husband is black. Um, I have, you know, more insight, I guess, than if my family was white. Um, um, but 
I also, obviously I have a ton of privilege because I'm a white woman, but like, I, I don't even feel comfortable on the island anymore. And so if I'm a, as a white person, don't feel comfortable on the island, I can only imagine how mm -hmm. black and brown people who live here, who visit here might feel. And so going back to like what Kim shared about microaggressions and not looking someone in the eye, turning away, like the white people, I think you know, in this group and hopefully in the broader city island, I hope can like look within themselves and think to themselves, you know, what mm -hmm. have I done to can, you know, you know, perpetuate a racist society? What, what, what lies have I been told that I've just been like, you know, um, so, cause we have to do something because what happened yesterday is, is horrific. Like that, that happened to a 14 year old girl and yeah. it could have got much worse and thank God it did. And Kim sounds like you raised a really strong, um, awesome kick-ass girl who, you know, is going to, um, stand up for what's right and stand up for herself. But like, we cannot leave it on to our children to fix society, you know, mm -hmm. so. We no, you're right, Abby. And it's about more than inclusion. And uh, towards that end, uh, Pastor Deborah Jenkins, she runs a, a community at Faith Church in Co-op City. Uh, she's leads a lot of talks on these matters and, and you know discussions on reparations and the like and she's kind of a trusted person within the co-op city community um i don't have all the details worked out but she is doing bias trainings now uh she's actually doing them with the 45th precinct believe it or not but she's doing these trainings to kind of bring the rest of us into understanding what we need to do and she has actually offered to do a training so I, I still need to run the logistics through the board, but knowing how they feel, um, I, I think we're gonna be setting something like that up soon. So you're right, it's about more than just inclusiveness. So I wanna thank you for that. And um, I wanna thank Kim for sharing her story. I'm gonna give a, um, I'm gonna give a brief community update to everybody, and then we're gonna open the floor. Um, and when we do the open floors, if everybody can just use that hand icon We'll unmute you. You'll get recognized. You'll get you know, You'll get your two minutes to you know say what you need to say, and we'll go from there. Absolutely. Um, so we have. Uh, I, I start with the good news. So I'm going to start with the good news today. Um, the good news, as people know, is that the speed camera, which is located right in the corner of um, of Carroll Street, should be online by the end of the month. Uh, anyone who lives close to City Island Avenue knows speeding's a real problem here. So between the hours of 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. Monday through Friday, that camera will be on. I know there is speeding beyond those hours. It's not lost on me. I just want everyone to know that this is what's written into the state law, the state statute. It's actually in the bill. You can look it up and see it for yourself. It's on uh, some of the websites and we'll repost it. But yeah, we are going to see at least a change of behavior to make the streets a little bit safer for everyone. So I want to thank um, I want to thank Assemblyman Benedetto. I want to thank Senator Biaggi. I want to thank uh, the mayor's office who all coordinated to make this happen. Um, it's really important. And you know this these cameras. Look, I don't like getting tickets. I know no one else does either. But it does change behaviors and it could save lives. And if it saves even one life, it's worth it. Um, also on the good news front, uh, as people know, we have been. Uh, we have been taking photos of drainage issues, uh, flooding happening throughout the community. Uh, these are long-term issues. This is stuff we talked about in our environmental forum. This is stuff we talked about when we had the Sea Grant program, which I'm gonna get to in a little bit, uh, documenting the flooding when we see it. Uh, we encourage you, if you do see flooding, pooling, whatever, in the community, continue to send it to us. We document it with the community board. We do document it with the Department of Environmental Protection. We document it with the Sea Grant program. As a result of that advocacy, um, there are the first, uh, the, the sewer project that had been put on the back burner for about 10 years has been moved to the front burner. Uh, Matt Cruz of the, uh, of the community board, community board 10, he has informed us that they are going to be doing storm sewer construction between Bridge Street and Kilrow Street. 
Uh, we are going to be having some sort of a site meeting in the not so distant future. So if you live near there, please let me know. And we're going to be hopefully pushing them to continue it to Cross Street because I know Cross Street uh, from speaking to the Kecks and the Gannons and everybody else is some of the worst uh, areas of pooling. But you know, we are starting to see progress on these things. And then when we are in a non uh, coronavirus world and we can start doing big meetings. I know DEP, Department of Environmental Protection, has agreed to come out here and do an on-site meeting. So that's super important. Uh, also on the good news front, uh, the corner of Hawkins Street is going to be daylighted so that people on Hawkins Street will have a little bit more visibility as they get out into their blocks. I know there are issues with daylighting's enforcement. Uh, we need people, when you see something, get on that 311 app register the complaint. It's a part of Comstat. Take a photo. You can send it to me. You can send it to Rising. You can send it to the other officers. Uh, this is how we make these corners and these intersections a little safer for everyone. So that means Schofield Street's been daylit. Pell Place has been daylit. Early Street has been daylit. Um, uh, obviously now Hawkins is going to be, and we're waiting to hear back on two more streets, uh, Carroll and Reynolds Street. And if anyone else has a DOT-related problem, you can speak to me, you can speak to um, anyone else, and we will try our best to help you with that or any government related problem. You know, several people on our board have worked in government. I personally work in government, but you know, we do bring us a level of expertise to this and we wanna put that to use to improve our community because we all want the best community for you know, our families, our children, what have you. Um, on to the bad news. Uh, we are gonna just kind of take it from the top here. As people know, there was um, some racist signs were posted throughout the community. I know they've, it's upset a lot of people and I know that's taken on kind of the forefront of discussions here tonight and that's totally appropriate. Um, I want you to know that I checked in with uh, Captain Frazier of the 45th Precinct two days ago. He informs me two reports were taken and uh, they've been referred to an investigation for the hate crimes unit of the NYPD. So you are filing those reports. They are being taken seriously. We are following up with them. And, you know, I understand that, you know, it's been, uh, it's been rumored and more than rumored, but that uh, one of the areas had a camera and that photos were taken. So I hope all that will be passed along and those people will be brought to justice. Um, also on the coronavirus front, uh, unfortunately, a lot of government is on hold right now. And two issues that we have had uh, champions on, uh, you know, particularly uh, universal pre-K, getting that back on City Island, that is on hold. I spoke to Assemblyman Benedetto about that earlier today. And then also the, the bus going 24-7 has been on hold. And that is something that we are... Um, you know, we are watching and, you know, hopefully will be resolved, but we are in communication with the Congresswoman's office as the federal government's probably going to have to come in and bail out the MTA. So we are, you know, speaking to her staff, you know, they really, they care and we're going to all try to work together to make sure that our community's voice is amplified uh, going forward. So that that's super important. Um, we do need some volunteers. So this is open call for volunteers. We have uh, three separate initiatives that are going on right now that we could really use help. And we count on you guys. And, you know, please let, you know, if you want to volunteer, you know, email me, uh, john.doyle at cityislandrising.org. Or you can just message me on Facebook or, or find me, uh, you know, get in touch with me any which way. Um, we have three different... Uh, initiatives. One is the, um, we have the community organizations involved in disaster. This was what Fernando Torado talked about. Uh, we have a, a little bit of a organizing committee together on this because we're trying to prepare for the second wave of the coronavirus when that comes. It's uh, Lois Wa of the, of, um, you know, who's been involved in many different uh, efforts. Uh, David Diaz and myself, but we would love to have more people involved as we start to coordinate with DOH to build a, a, a rapid response to emerging things as they, come, as, they, as they come forward. You know, we did do a mass drive. We delivered over a thousand masks. We just got more masks from Community Board 10. Thank you. Uh, and from the mayor's office, we will continue to give out masks. If you know people who are in business and they're having issues, you know, we've given masks to 
uh, you know, different small businesses so that we can all keep safe. And that's super important. Um, and if you know, again, there, there is still unfortunately a stigma for those in need, even though a million people are out of work in this city and 30 million people throughout the country. Um, if, if you know neighbors who are in need of food, please let us know and we will pair them with resources that they need. You know, we are helping people already, but we, wanna we want, nobody should go without in the richest country in the world and in a neighborhood like this where people are very giving. So please, if there are people who are food insecure, uh, you know, let us know. Let's, let's all try to work together to you know, help our neighbors as much as we can. That's what we're all here for. Um, and then finally, uh, we're probably not gonna do an August meeting, but we're looking to do, as I said earlier, the bias training with Pastor Deb. And we're also looking to do uh, a C Grant training. Uh, C Grant was the community in our last in-person meeting in March. We had someone come who has been coordinating with OEM, where we're documenting all the flooding through an app to make sure that this is all, you know, how much flooding it is, where it is, how deep the flooding is, so that when monies become available, we're going to try to apply for those and work with our elected officials to make sure that climate change issues right here on City Island continue to be addressed. So this is all, again, super important to build on what's going on with the sewer project and to uh, you know, move those things forward. So please, if you're interested in just, again, it's very simple. When there's flooding, you'll go out, take some photos, send them in through the app, and that way we can make sure everything on City Island is super you know, well-documented because the things that get measured are usually the things that get done. So we've gotta be proactive. We need to step forward. We need to get that done. Um, we are also working on a blood drive. Uh, I have been in touch with the New York Blood Center. It has been, they need 2,000 square foot spaces to do a, uh, a socially distant blood drive. Blood, uh, blood uh, donations in general are down. So this is a very good thing that we can all do. It is very difficult to get 2,000 spaces. I've went to four, five different places, uh, been rejected by three, haven't heard back from one, and just went to another one today. So if you know someone who has that level of space and would be willing to do this, you know, this is, this is another one of those things that we can do to step up as neighbors that doesn't cost a dollar and can help save lives. So that would conclude uh, my report for right now. I see we have a question here. Um, expand on the bias training. I will absolutely do that. I just need to get all the details together, but it will be led by Pastor Deb. She is a... Um, recognized voice on this matter. She's a pastor in Co-op City. She does some work with the Clergy Council. Um, you know, a wonderful person uh, who's been involved in community life in the greater area for decades plus. So we'll be working with her to put something together and we have that information. We will get it out there and we want to do it in a way that, you know, changes hearts and minds. Um, does anyone, I see we have one hand up, so I'm going to recognize this person for question one. Jonathan, are you there? Hello. I'm here. I'm right here. Great. Great. So, uh, you, had said you wanted to add. Yeah, actually, I just have a couple of announcements from Senator Biaggi's office. Great. Uh, okay. So uh, the two announcements is number one, our office has not opened up yet. We're in there's no, we don't know when that's going to be. Uh, in the meantime, we're still operating remotely and we are all accessible by email and phone. Please reach out to us if you need anything at biagi at nysenate.gov. Call our office, our phone number is 718-822-2049. Um, our second announcement is there is going to be a Battle of the Boroughs phone banking event um, on Saturday, on Saturday. Well, actually next week, I'm gonna uh, attach the information into the chat. So we are phone banking between Senator Salazar, Salazar's office 
in our office to see who can respond, who can call the most people and get them to respond uh, to the census. And I don't have to tell you guys what, how, why uh, the census is so important. It determines just about everything from the amount of funding you need to get uh, to get flood mitigation done, especially because it's an issue on, on City Island. There are some parts of the island where um, when the tide changes, instant flood, daily. Mm -hmm. um, so the census influences that. So the more people that get counted and get on the on the rolls of the census, the better off that uh, that our, our community and our country largely uh, will be. Um, and that is it on on, um, on my end. Uh, I've attached the link, and I'm just going to put the contact information for our office. And I really enjoyed being here tonight again. So thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Jonathan, for sharing that. That's super important. And thank you for all that your office is doing for us. And, uh, you know, definitely people, if you haven't filled out the census, fill out the census. We're looking to get more involved in it ourselves. And we'll be coordinating with the senator to augment the good work she's doing in the community with the census. So we can all work in tandem. Uh, and people should participate in that event, back, uh, Battle of the Boroughs, because the Bronx always needs to beat Brooklyn. And I just, I just dropped the link to the census uh, in the chat. Um, it's super easy. It's so important. If you haven't done it yet, um, you can just click on that link right in the chat and do it right this second. Um, and because uh, it really is so critically important to making sure um, that everybody quite literally counts um, mm -hmm. and uh, is, is tied to so many uh, really important decisions um, that are made uh, in, in terms of uh, funding and representation over the next 10 years. So uh, if you've already done it, tell your friends. Uh, it's just my2020census.gov. Super easy. And they have census jobs out right now. We just posted about it on our social media pages. If you're looking for good part-time work, get a job with the census. They pay, I believe it's starting at $18 an hour. And you can, it's flexible hours, it's part-time. Please consider it. Yep, and in okay. some cases, I think they're even paying up to $23 hey. an hour. Even, yeah, and, hey, even. and I will be working as a census numerator this summer as well. Just oh, because good. I want to help get as many people counted as possible. It is so important. Absolutely, and, and New York stands yeah, we're at the tipping point, is my understanding, between losing one or two congressional seats. So if we do a really good job, we help preserve our voices in Congress and in power. Uh, Joanne has a question. Um, Joanne, I'm going to unmute you if you can, or can you please unmute yourself and go right ahead. Hello? Okay, uh, we will wait to hear from her. Uh, she's been unmuted, so when she has her question together, we will go forward on that. Does anyone else have a question of um, any sort that we can answer, that anyone has a concern over? I already found out I missed one thing. David Diaz of our group, who is not here right now, um, but has been working very hard behind the scenes and has been delivering countless meals to people is do is putting together a clean sweep program so we're going to take all the volunteer opportunities and put them on a nice presentable flyer and get them out to everybody because between the co-ed between the clean sweep between um you know some of these other things we have going on the sea grant program there, there's a real you know there's a real need to do more and we want you all to be a part of it and the more people, the more hands we have, the easier, the lighter the work will be for, for all of us here. So please, uh, you know, volunteer where you can. And um, I'm looking, there are two hands up. Louisa, take it away. Can you guys hear me? Okay, good. I have headphones in. I don't know how it works. Anyway, um, I just want to acknowledge, John, thank you for... Um, a few weeks ago, we had an issue where the boats on the water were playing music very loudly and it was starting at like midnight and it went on until 6 a.m. I got no sleep that night, but yeah. 
you know, I made two 311 requests, like one at 4 a.m. and one at 5 a.m., sent it to John, and John followed up with the 45th Precinct. And, I mean, don't get me wrong, there have been issues since then of noise complaints happening after, like, 11 p.m. throughout the week. But I just wanted to thank John for always, you know, following up with the 45th Precinct about it. Thank you. Happy to do it. And uh, ironically, it came up in uh, the borough, com the, the new community affairs commissioner for downtown. There was a conference call between the precinct councils and the, the Harbor patrols. The only thing that's not really in danger of being cut because they already have the apparatus and they already have the specially trained officers. So they're not going to move that. So please let your friends and neighbors know about that because uh, that's super important. Um, does anyone else have a question uh, or anything that they'd like to mention before we close out the meeting. Okay. Well, if anyone has anything, feel free to reach out to myself, Beverly, Louisa, Stephanie uh, Fisher, um, Kim uh, Woodruff, who's on the call, Teresa Cavity, whatever we can do to help you. And again, we're gonna we have a lot of volunteer efforts we need to get off the ground. So. Let's all work together and let's make some great things happen. Thank you all so very much. Have a nice night. It was good to be with all of you again. Thank you.